Thank you all. So I'm going to have you serving also as slide clicker. Yes, slide clicker. Apologies if it's hard to see some of that up there. It should be helpful material to go through. Our primary focus today, and by our I mean all of us, is going to be discussing school-based violence, particularly gun violence. So gun violence happening out in the community, important, critical. We need to spend time thinking about it and discussing it. It is not our primary focus today because I only get you for 15 minutes and we have to be able to narrow down certain bits of the param um, certain parameters of the discussion. So if you would, please. And then the next one. So let us actually the next one too. I added, I actually added things to this in general. I say school shooting violence, what comes to mind? Bunch of drills. Safety drills, lock down the school environment. We're seeing more and more of those embedded into school based practices. On a personal fun note, my daughter's first day of kindergarten this year, they actually, the first week, I should say, they did have a lockdown, not based on gun violence, but based on an irate parent. I still have questions over what happened there. Anything else? It's the debate of gun laws. We need to get rid of guns. If we purge them all, we will magically solve this problem. What's the other side of that debate? Usually if there's gun violence, TV talking heads start shouting one of two things. We need to ban guns is the overly simplified answer on the left side of the debate. What's the right side? Nope. That has come up before. One of you was saying something about guns don't. So what causes people to kill people? True. I'm thinking more of a specific answer that Republican politicians and Republican thinkers tend to come up with more often than not. You'll notice I'm going to blame both sides here because both sides are stupid. This is my professional opinion. Mental health. They're clearly mentally ill. That's where the problem is. It's too much guns. It's too much mental illness. Here's the reality. Neither side is anywhere close to a realistic answer. There are lots of different pieces to this particular puzzle. <clears throat> so for the reading today, which exactly is one page, it's a joint exercise by the FBI and the Secret Service to dig back through existing case studies of known school shooting incidents. Is there anything that stuck out to you? Anything of interest on those bullet points? Any descriptors out there that you thought, hmm, this seems odd? Or I didn't realize this about school gun violence. Um, that there is not a profile of a school shooter. It's not a one sized fits all event. And it's surprisingly difficult for us to define what is the event itself. And we will get to that point. So there's not a one-size-fits-all profile. There's probably several different characteristics along the way, and we should probably delve into what each of those are. Anything else stand out? Ninety-three percent of people who do this kind of violence behave in a way that tips off somebody ahead of time that there could be a problem. That is what stands out to me as well. As a, if we paid more attention to each other, checked in with each other more often, we might, we're certainly not going to prevent 100% of all of these, we're not going to go from as much school violence we get today to no violence tomorrow like that. But we need good practices, strategies, and policy guidelines to help reduce the nature of this conduct. So most people plan ahead. These are not spur of the moment acts of violence. They look like that to those of us who watch them unfolding on the news and are scared out of our pants. If you would please. So school plus gun plus violent conduct visited upon other people. I put those three categories to together. 
how much of this is happening. How frequently is it happening? Is there a school shooting incident every single day across the country? Probably, but you're not sure. Who here says this sounds like a trick question and I think there isn't a real answer to it? Congratulations, you have all avoided the trap. Next one, please. We don't exactly know how many there are because we do have to define certain pieces of that puzzle ahead of time. And one of them, and this is very grim, is body counts. How many people have to be shot for it to count as a school gun violence incident? Put another way, if high school me's girlfriend breaks up with him and I'm horribly despondent over it, I take my dad's gun, I drive to school, and as I see her walking into school, I call her, I get her attention, and then I commit suicide. That technically is school gun violence, because it has happened on school grounds, a gun is involved, and a person was killed or injured as a result. Is that the same category as me taking an AR-15 or a weapon that is designed to hurt lots and lots of people and spreading violence across the school itself? That's why the definition has to involve body counts. That's why it gets particularly grim, but we do need some ways of defining what is and is not school-based violent conduct. Anybody want to guess when the first one happened? Nineteen seventies? There have been some in the seventies. Anybody want to go older than that? Fifties. Do I hear prior to that? We're turning this into an auction house for some reason. The first recorded incident in America of a school and gun and people dying is 1764. So before we were actually a country, we had this particular problem. But in the age in which we live, where national news networks are reporting information 24 hours a day, the first one we tend to think about goes back to the 90s in Columbine High School in Colorado, where two guys staged an extremely violent incident. First one up, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so in the world of criminology, we are devoted to understanding the making of laws, the breaking of laws, and the reactions to the breaking of laws. That is what the world is. And our goal is to develop theories to explain human behavior, particularly deviance. But it is not just to develop a theory in the abstract. I'm not sitting in my office ruminating over the causes of deviant conduct like I understand humans better than everybody else does. It is my job to test theory, to look at patterns of crime as they're unfolding and say, what are the linkages here? What are the factors that come together to make this particular crime happen? And then how do I test that theory amongst offenders and amongst criminal justice data? So we're going to talk about three of them today and just kind of think about each one in the context of mass school violence. And now I added a word, mass, and we will get into how we define that, which is imperfectly. General strain theory begins with the premise that you, me, and everybody experiences strain. I say strain, what's an example that applies to you? Hmm? Stress? What's something that stressed you out recently? Uh, fire call this morning. Sorry, what? Fire call this morning. You got a fire call? You work for a fire department? Impressive. I salute you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so that is a difficult scenario that you cannot escape from because it is the nature of your job. Inability to escape from a negative stimuli is one source of strain, saith the authors of general strain theory. So that's one example. Anybody do badly on a test? Let's go for some easier ones, lighthearted stuff. Not get person you have a crush on to go on a date with you. Not get the internship or field placement that you were hoping for. Not achieve a desired outcome. Failure to achieve desired outcome, point number two. And loss of a positive stimuli, point number three. So you have all experienced something that falls into one or more of those three categories recently. We all have. All of us experience strain 
is the point of this particular theory. But what happens when we experience that strain? The authors call it negative emotional processing. Anger, anxiety, fear, depression. These are reasonable emotions that all people experience. This isn't kindergarten where we need to process emotions out loud, but we do need to deal with them. You have an emotional experience, and what happens next depends on your coping skills or what coping techniques are applied for you to be able to process that emotional experience. What do you guys like to do to de-stress? Video games? Good one. Turn my brain off, engage in something fun, give me a couple hours of just downtime. I heard nap as an option. I'm not sure who said it, but yes, please. Love that concept completely. Physically engaging your body. These are all good coping skills. As are, yep. No. Is that a good one or a negative coping skill because of the financial burden that it puts on you? It's not a financial burden on me. Okay, then. On whoever it is that pays the credit card. We'll make it that person's fault. A very good coping skill that we tend to underutilize, talking out loud. Here is what's bothering me today. Having a friend, family member, confidant, or counselor that we can go to to say, here is where my anxiety is, my fears are, my what is stressing me out today? Being able to talk it out with somebody else solves lots and lots of problems. Does not solve all of them and will not solve this one perfectly. You know what's a commonly used coping skill that we should all probably do less of? I'm really stressed out. Had a bad day, my students were jerks. I got beer in my fridge. I'm going to go home, crack open a beer, sit on the couch, and just kind of de-stress for a while. On the one hand, alcohol can be a pleasurable experience. On the other hand, it can very easily lead to other related problems. And depending on quality and utilization of coping skills, that negative emotional experience can grow, resulting in violent conduct. If I'm really, really stressed, I go home and then my family's just stressing me out further, I'm going to haul off and start yelling at people, or I might even start engaging in some form of physical violence. So we have one theory. Our next <clears throat> is something we have all done as well, and that is observed someone do something that produced an outcome that we wanted, and we copied that behavior. So social learning theory is a psychological concept and a criminological one, and it does boil down to monkey see, monkey do. My favorite example of this, when my daughter was between one and about 18 months, so she's walking around at this point and babbling a lot and doesn't really have a whole lot of words yet, but she would pick up her toys, hold them to the side of her head, and kind of babble. And it took us a while to figure out why is she doing that. Because she sees mom and dad holding phones to their head, and she's copying that behavior. And she wants to, as a small child, mimic the behavior of the, of the big people because the big people do the things that she wants to. They walk around, they talk, they get food, they don't have to ask for help to get stuff done. Similarly, if I'm a teenager and I'm hungry, I want to steal a snack from a corner store, I see an older kid keeping tabs on the clerk, clocking around looking for security cameras, grabbing an item, sticking it in his pocket, walking out the door. I have seen what he has done, and the outcome is he got a snack for himself or something that he wanted. If I want that same outcome, I will copy those same behaviors. Similarly, if I am a lonely, depressed, feel socially isolated high schooler with access to weaponry, as one example, and I see news reports and the internet and TV talking about the last person who engaged in a school shooting event, and all of them asking the question, why did he do this? And yes, I'm focusing on he. That's an outcome that I want. Attention. People talking about me. To feel like I matter. So I might engage in violent conduct in a horribly extreme manner to get that outcome for myself. And then we have one more. There's a theory that basically says all crime, violent, property, drug-based, everything, boils down to whether you're a person with low self-control or not. How many of you are impulsive people? If I put a cookie down in front of you and say, you can eat this cookie now, 
Or if you wait five minutes, I'll bring a plate with two cookies and you can have that plate instead. How many of you are already munching on the cookie before I stop talking? In theory, you are an impulsive person, although I have problems with the cookie test that we use. How many of you, like roller coasters, would be willing to jump out of a plane with a parachute attached? You're not going to kill yourself in a violent manner, but bungee cord jumping, any extreme kind of sports fanatics out there. I want to get my heart racing. I want to feel that joy and tension. I'm seeing one or two hands go up there. How many of you are horribly insensitive to the needs, wants, or concerns of others? The world is focused on me and me alone. How many of you, if you're really pissed off in the moment, you will react with physical violence? You'll push me or punch me as I just get this guy to stop talking. Yeah, I'll get in trouble for it later, but right now I'm feeling a very strong emotional experience and I need to deal with that and I don't care about long-term planning. I am exaggerating a lot of these qualities. Also, if you are more of a physically active person as opposed to a mentally active person, or if you are somebody who isn't really good with words, you don't like to express it out loud, you just want to deal with it, whatever it is, and move on. The authors behind this theory, and it is psychologically based, say that early in childhood, your self-control level is pretty much set, and it has a lot to do with how your parents raise you. But if you're saying, yep, to all of those things, and you're like, yep, 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 that's me, all of those things are who I am, and I think only one of you had your hand up for three of them, and I'm not going to assume you are a naturally violent person, but then you are reactive, impulsive, possibly prone towards violent conduct. So of these three theories, is there one that might make more sense when we apply it to the concept of mass gun violence. Keep all three in mind. We have one more slide to get through, and then we'll open up for some Q&A. So I introduced the word mass gun violence on school grounds. And what does that mean? It means I have to specify a body count. I need to specify the number of people that were injured or killed by guns in a singular incident on school grounds, excluding the shooter themselves. So me taking a gun to school to kill myself to get my ex-girlfriend's attention is a tragic event, but we are going to treat it as qualitatively different from acting out violently towards others. And one definition, you may agree with them, you might not, is to use a minimum of four individuals killed or injured by a shooter on school grounds. That is this little chart up here, and the glare is pretty strong, but all the way at the far side is 1996, and all the way up here is 2018. And if you set that count as four or more killed or injured, then actually the number of incidents is pretty small over the last several decades. It is not zero. We must never pretend that it's zero. Every single bullet point or dot point up there is someone who deserves our time and attention, and we should be figuring out how to make these things go away. So that is not my answer of saying it's so small we don't need to think about it. Hell no. Do not listen to those people. But is four the right number? It is if you're Dr. Fox and Dr. Friedel who came up with that particular approach. Your answer might look a little bit different. One more, please. You can look this one up as well. The Violence Project by Peterson and Densley, they define, they set a lower cap. I believe theirs is three or more, but they did a deep review. And this is the problem with studying these things. They can be so small in number that it's hard to systematically study them. And they happen in different states, different jurisdictions. There's not a singular database that exists that touches solely on this. There's a lot of nonprofit groups that try to track it, but they include a wider parameter. They include non-school gun violence, for example. Every Town for Gun Safety produces some interesting data, but theirs goes beyond school-based incidents. And again, I do want to apply some context so that we might figure out why this in particular is happening, because there are some factors at play here that we should all be aware of. So if I use Peterson and Densley's approach, they did a deep review of law enforcement records, various news accounts, print, TV, national, local. They looked all across the country. 
And they ultimately came up with a list of 180 individual cases of school violence, particularly those using guns, on multiple victims. And they did a retrospective study. Dig back through the individual offender. Interview them if they're still alive, although most are not. Family members, friends, social media accounts, survivors, pull news record records, anything you can to try to find some common experience or common insights that might help us predict who the next one's going to be. Because sadly, we all recognize this is likely to happen again. If you would, sir. And what they found was a four-stage sequence. It does not explain everybody. There are individual school shooters who do not fit this exact pattern down to a T. But as you read through or discover who these offenders are and look back through their personal history, more often than not, you see most, if not all, of these points here. First and foremost, childhood trauma. My parents got divorced. Mine didn't, but an example. One parent died. Or what frequently happens, physical, sexual, or psychological abuse. My dad never stopped beating me as a kid. I was constantly put down for weight, being too effeminate, not being good at sports. Whatever that characteristic is, it is constant enough that it weighs in on you. And then we get to point number two. You might think that that was my childhood, but I've moved past it. I can let go of my past. Unless you have good coping skills, hey, look, general strain theory seems to fit reasonably well here. You hold on to that. It stays with you. It builds inside you. It becomes high points of emotional tension. Generalized anxiety disorder, social withdrawal from other environments, inability to socialize or feel confident in yourself, so I'm just going to shy away from interacting with other kids. And then, on top of that, you feel like you're on the outside, pressed up against the glass, watching every other kid in school who seems to have figured it out. It, in this case, means social competency. They all have friends. They all have activities they do together. They have a sense of identity within their peer group in this school context. Why is it all these other kids have this figured out, and I'm the only weirdo on the outside who doesn't? Spoiler alert, nobody in school does. We all just fake it. But childhood trauma, unresolved, emotional buildup, negative or usually negative, hostile depression or anger building up internally, and the perception that everybody else has it figured out and they're going to leave me on the outside. Step three of that then is suicidal ideation. I want to kill myself because then at least this pain goes away, this weird thing where everybody else has life figured out except me. It hurts too much. It's too awkward. I don't like it. I don't want to be a part of it, so I'm going to then kill myself. How do you go from that to expressing that in terms of violence outward? There we get to step four. You have internalized a lot of hatred and aggression, and step four unfortunately has gotten worse in this day and age. Specifically, the internet giveth and the internet taketh away. The internet giveth so many wonderful things that we can utilize. Streaming services, gaming platforms, random really cool recipes to try with a family that will not appreciate them. Sorry, that's my personal beef. But it also causes problems. Namely, if I'm angry, resentful, or bitter towards other people, there's going to be an online community of people like me. So if I feel like a socially rejected, awkward, bitter teenager, you better believe there's some social media group somewhere of other people who feel that exact same way who will validate my feelings and validate my resentment of the others and will say it is absolutely their fault because they didn't support you, their indifference is actually their hatred towards you, it is entirely their fault. I can't get girl to date me, should I actually work on improving myself internally, or should I just blame women? There's an online support group that will help me say, nope, it's women's fault. They should totally date you because that's what movie and TV always gives us, that these things are things you're entitled to. So 
instead of killing myself, or perhaps on top of killing myself, I am now very angry and fixated not on individuals within my school who are the popular kids, but on the vast indifference of everybody else at that school who is ignoring my pain, my difficulties, or my struggles. And now we get to the key point. And one more, please. <clears throat> Their conclusion. I don't agree with it 100% of the time, but I agree with it 90 plus percent of the time is that school shooters are committing suicide. That is their goal. It's just they want to take as many others down with them as humanly possible. So get me weapons that have large capacity to shoot lots of bullets at various points of time so that I can kill a whole bunch of other people and then turn that weapon on myself or that I might commit something called suicide by cop. First officers that arrive at the scene should then shoot me and make all of this pain and difficulty go away. I go down in a blaze of angry glory, and I get my fame, and I get my attention, and I get that validation for what I wanted. So that's a happy, fun, cheerful thought. I do have one more slide, but I think we could skip that one for now, because it mostly is just oversimplification of politics, and we kind of hit on that point already. <clears throat> we need this. We need to be able to say, here is what mass school violence is, and here is what it's not. The downside is that we can quibble within the research community over exactly how we operationally define things, and we can spend all of our time doing that, and it gets us no closer to a resolution. But from this answer up here, is there a theory that makes more sense than others? And is there anything we can do about that? Or do we all just need to sit there and say, well, these things happen and there's no answer we'll ever come up with that solves them? Ends my side. All right. I open the floor. And we can go back over slides because they're kind of blurry print. Let me offer a round of applause. For this. Thank you. Uh, it is now, uh, check the time. Uh, one o'clock, I know some people might have to go, students, uh, you're a captive audience for 20 minutes, but typically, other guests, typically we uh, open the floor for a few questions, so please feel free to stick around for those questions if you can. Otherwise, those who are, some of you are here for blueprint credit, the QR code is here on your way out, you can scan that. But we'll go ahead and address questions because people who are in class, we have, uh, Dr. Ibn Judge wanted to also go over a few things for you before Friday. So, what, what topic of this, um, this lecture really relates to pressure the most? I would say the sequence right here, going from trauma to the internalizing buildup and then finding an outlet for it. So when he first suggested that the topic would be pressure, I'm sorry if my head went into Encanto, my kid's been loving that movie, but like the song Surface Pressure and how I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine with all the pressure I've internalized until suddenly I'm not. Um, I think there were a couple of hands at the back. Yes. This question around gender. Sure. So, school shooters, um, what are the statistics around? The briefer actually has it. It's more than 90% male. I think it's 97% male, if, but I don't have that one perfectly memorized. The, the demographic points are vast majority male, vast majority white. But that's about as far as we go. Other than that, there's a whole lot of variety that happens. Why is it that it's white guys? Hard to say. I don't want to go with the assumptions of entitlement that I should get the girl or I should get the fame and the social status simply by being a white guy. But it's hard to, like, I don't have a better answer other than that one. And I don't fully buy that one myself. Or was that your question? <laughs> I, I was uh, curious if they went into, because you, you kind of mentioned the internet, and you mentioned you know, how someone was raised, and that it's, um, yeah, if they do mention how boys are talking to boys, like, what the, I feel like, because some of those core aspects yep. um, are, you know, boys, and, you know, forcing at each other, that's what we do, and like this kind of uh, acceptance or allowance for a certain type of expression of masculinity. Um, but, and, you know, 
that does nail it perfectly because a big part of um, what general strain theory did is it adapted a previous theory that kind of would have assumed that crime rates would be equal among male and female, and it's not. Men commit more crime than women do. So the theory kind of dug into, well, are we teaching girls and women to kind of internalize and utilize different coping mechanisms, and we're just kind of teaching boys to know, put it outside or to not deal with emotional buildup or emotional difficulties. For the most part, yeah, it does kind of look like that's where the pattern tends to be. But why is it white versus other racial categories? No idea. Access to firearms, maybe. Could be part of it, but it's hard to tell. Um, I was going to say maybe it's because in the news, uh, it is common that white people get more attention in the news. And the, since attention is a very big thing in for the issues, I guess it drives white people a bit more because they know they'll be on the news? Could be. That could factor into it. If I'm seeing news reports of it, and most of the time I'm seeing it's a white male shooter, hey, look, I'm a white man. I want attention. Let me get this. I think there were two hands back there and then yours. Um, Excellent question. I believe, and you may challenge me on this point, that we are kind of taught to mind our own business. We are not taught to take the mental health concerns of other people as fair or valid. If your close friends, if you get a sense that they're having a bad day, do you want to step in and say, hey, what's going on? Can we have a chat? I'm here as a friend. Or are you going to be like, let me just let them sort it out on their own? If it's a really close friend, like your best friend, you want to step in, right? Be a source of comfort. If it's a casual acquaintance, person you kind of know, you've taken a couple of classes with, but you're not really buddy-buddy with them, you're going to behave differently? Yeah. I'm not blaming you. I'm saying that's a universal. We have all been taught to just not deal with that. So when she just says, instead of like, beginning of the lecture, that there's not really like a profile for a school shooter, but also makes you wonder, because through everything you've gone through in this lecture, it kind of seems like there is a profile. A white male who has been through those four um, four things in their life. I mean, that's, that's like a basic profile, right? It can be. These are researchers working independently. Those, uh, the profile was written by the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit. So they are coming at it more from the perspective of agents, looking more at criminal incidents, and looking at just kind of how we conduct investigations normally. I mean, this is a pattern they found, but they themselves say, and I agree, like it, it's not 100%. It does not fit all, all incidents. The Stoneman Douglas shooter, for example, um, I'm blanking on his name, Cruz, he dropped his weapon and tried to hide in the crowd like he was a normal student, and they ultimately found out it was him. He's one that was taken alive, where so many others either committed suicide or were killed by law enforcement responding to the scene. But is there, does this trauma build up, kind of internalizing and then externalizing, does it explain everything? I'm not 100% sure that it does. I think it provides a good roadmap for us to work from. As a, if we did a better job of trying to maybe sort this part of things, and this is actually going to be where we dig into class on Friday to kind of get into what are mental health resources, how do we build a culture that values engaging with each other so that I can ask you how you're doing without making it seem kind of awkward. In regards to social learning, so I see uh, criminals get a lot of attention. Yep. And so I repeat that. Do you think like today most recently, like Netflix releasing a nine episode documentary on Jeffrey Dahmer. In like some of these gaining attention things, oh wow, so if I, I can get attention, I can get a nine episode documentary of me committing a horrible crime. Like, do you think we're moving backwards in, in respect that we're glorifying a lot of these mass murders? We absolutely are glorifying serial killers to an absurd extent. I'm not sure that releasing a dramatized version or a miniseries or even documentaries that we are 
is going to cause the next generation of them because there's other factors that that caused you to move towards violence, such as family trauma is a likely early indicator. But yeah, living in the world of we're seeing Netflix and everybody else just glorify the lives of and how many Ted Bundy movies have they made so far? Like this is could we move on to other stuff? We could, but this is what titillates us. This is what we consider to be personally fascinating. I think your hand was up first. Or maybe I made that up. All right. Do you also feel like there's like instances of like social suicide that they want to see like people hate them as much as they hate themselves? Because like it's like because there are people who like don't feel themselves like they want to see like the aftermath and they want to see how people react to what they've done. Kind of like internet trolls, but out in the real world causing serious violence. I like it. In that it makes sense to me. It is not a, a good thing, but yeah. Good attention is what I want. Bad attention is something I will take because it's better than no attention at all. So I can yell and scream and shout to the internet all I want, but so is everybody else doing that. They're not getting anybody following them or tracking what's going on. So is there a scenario in my head where bad attention beats no attention? Yeah. And certainly trying to just see people's reaction could certainly be part of it. I think there was one or two other. Um, after that one, I wanted to actually. Uh, True. Are sure? Yeah, we're almost out of time. So one of my roles is to make sure that they know how to stitch this together. Mm -hmm. And so we have these two different sets of scholars that are looking something and providing different interpretations. Yep. Could you speak to the necessity for people to define through interpretation what is and what is not gun violence? Like what is that role of, of that interpretation? So it does speak more towards policy language. And does the Second Amendment actually guarantee that we all have an individual right to bear a weapon? Or does it speak to the needs of the militia, the organized law enforcement or military? You th the, in the courts have decided that individual ownership is written into the Second Amendment. When did they make that decision, though? Way, way back, all the way back in the ancient year of 2008. Up until that point, does the Second Amendment actually say you have the right to own or carry a firearm? It's assumed, but it wasn't built into law. So the nature of gun violence then does relate to, are there policies we can put in place that safeguard against the quote unquote wrong person getting a gun, such as boyfriend laws or red flag laws that suggest you haven't been convicted of a felony, but you're stalking an ex-girlfriend, or there are multiple charges filed against you, just no, nothing that's been actively prosecuted. The ability to kind of conceptually discuss the nature of this kind of violence separate from other forms of violence, such as knives or other weaponry or negligent conduct, ties into the question of what are the laws we have that regulate or allow for control of this kind of behavior. And by focusing more on gun violence, are we a naturally more violent people than Canada or Britain? or any other similar Western-style democracy. We put a lot more of our people into prison than they collectively do. The question is, are we actually more violent? That requires a lot more interpretation and a lot more data. And I love the, the phrasing of that, that we have scholars from different perspectives utilizing slightly different approaches, but coming to, I think as you pointed out, very different conclusions. Some saying there's different profiles, but there's not a one-size-fits-all category. And others saying there's a pretty common theme. If you're looking for it, you'll see it. And what do we then do with this information? Well, we need to be able to separate gun-based suicide, such as that one example cited from earlier, versus externalizing violence built on mass damage to other people. Because if we recognize these things as fundamentally different things, they just look the same because they involve a gun. But they actually have different causes, different underlying factors to them. And if we treated them differently, if we built good policy, good law, 
good strategy, and if we taught people these are things to look for, we can solve some of them, or we can make them smaller. We just can't necessarily solve all of them. I would say my takeaway message on this, and I apologize if I'm rambling and off topic here, is this for me, the distinctions of defining what is and isn't the category is on par with a cancer researcher saying, I am studying this particular form of this disease, which requires me to then hyper-focus on the risk factors associated with this version of it. What we as a general public tend to do is we just lump it into gun violence as a big, broad, terrifying category, and then not picking apart the smaller scenarios, the smaller contexts of this is what feeds into this particular form of aggressive violence. And then we get the fun of, I literally got a call, it was the Friday of the first week of kindergarten, like the school district saying, we have locked down the classrooms, we have opened it up again, there was an irate parent, and I'm like, you, you, what now? I need more answers, I'm going to be there in five minutes to get my kid out, wait, no, I'm going to let her finish the day, and then go from there. Yeah, one more question. Okay, so um, I understand there's multiple profiles for school shooters, and you know this is one of the common similarities. But I saw Stoney Douglas, and they actually just started doing the trial after four years. Mm -hmm. It's been over the past month or so, but they just did closing arguments yesterday. And the school shooter at that high school was faking a lot of mental illness when he was getting his like psychological exam done. So I'm sure we all go through like trauma, trauma like a good handful of us and stuff. So do you think these common similarities are like used to justify them too much, like too often? I think somebody like him is going to grasp at it as a something that mitigates his responsibility for it. I look at it as a if we did a better job of recognizing where this is happening and trying to cut it off somewhere else along the way, and I don't have an answer as to what that looks like. There are things we could be doing better, putting more money into guidance counselor resources and services. My strategy is if we took care of this, there would be fewer and fewer of these. In his case, though, are you allowed to then say, well, I was, you know, my dad, I think it was, he was raised adoptive and there's allegations of physical abuse. I've read some of his case. I have not dug into it fully. But. Does that mitigate responsibility? In the case of mass school violence, I would say no, just because this requires planning. You have to acquire weapons. As the profile sheet taught us, almost all of them engaged in some form of planning ahead of time. How can I get my weapons in if there's metal detectors? Where do I start? What hour of the day? What hallway? What lunchroom is going to be the most crowded? All of that is active planning and intent to cause serious harm to others. So if you have done that kind of behavior, you have demonstrated clear intent behind it. We're out of time. Thank you all.